This is TREP Wire Week in Review for week ending July 2nd. I'm Martha Kocher with TREP, a data modeling and analytics firm for the CMBS commercial real estate and CLO markets. I'm with Manus Clancy, Senior Managing Director, and Joe McBride, Head of C Refinance. This week, the U.S. will fall short of the President's 70% vaccination target for July 4th, and the Supreme Court leaves the eviction moratorium in place. In economic news, weekly jobless claims fell to another post-pandemic low. U.S. manufacturing grew, but slower than expected. Pending home sales rose unexpectedly in May, and consumer confidence rose in June to its highest level. Manus, while we head into the holiday weekend, tomorrow's jobs report will be watched for signals on Fed policy and inflation. Uh, certainly, it's it's a it's a big number. You know, we go through cycles, don't we, with this economic data at, at various points. The only thing people watch are, you know, the Fed minutes and whether the Fed is raising rates or or cutting rates, and and sometimes it's inflation numbers, and and that's certainly been a, a big indicator and a heavily watched number for the several months. But really, you know, the big thing everybody's looking for right now is is the jobs number and what that will mean for how robust this recovery is, what that will mean for Fed policy, um, what that might mean for other governmental moves, you know, whether it's spending or tax policy or anything else. So it's a big one. The interesting thing about tomorrow is that, you know, we're at the end of a week where trading desks have been sparsely populated um, you get a lot of he's off the desk when you make phone calls looking for people. And tomorrow is part of a a short day for the bond market. So it's kind of you watch the number, you, re- you react instantaneously, and then you get on your train or in your car to the mountains or the beaches and, 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 and call it a day. So um, as a result, most of this week has been uh, lacking volatility because a lot of people are off. We'll see if that changes on Friday morning and, and what that number does to bonds and stocks. I think this week we'll get straight into the real estate stuff, but I'll just, a couple of headlines that I'm watching. One is that there's that headline on Wall Street Journal right about now about, what is it, 130 countries agreeing to uh, some sort of minimum corporate tax, which is just kind of seems to be the way of the the world these days is towards higher taxes. Uh, We also had a big sale out in Las Vegas, MGM Resorts agrees to sell Las Vegas City Center for $3.9 billion. That's a good one. And uh, the only other one, we talked about it last week a little bit, the Supreme Court declined, and you mentioned this in your, in your intro, Martha, but declined to lift the moratorium eviction that the CDC had put forth. And uh, as Martha deftly uh, mentioned before the podcast, Kavanaugh basically was that he was the deciding vote. And he basically just said, because they're ending it in a few weeks anyway, like, let's just, let's just say it's okay, which I can kind of find funny. Uh, but if it was, you know, if it was supposed to last for another year or two, they might've struck it down. And one other, one other headline is we talked about home prices last week, but the core logic S and P Schiller index came out yesterday and it's the highest year over year growth in median home prices ever since they've been keeping track of it, I think, which was in like the late eighties. So I thought I bought at the peak six months ago, but I guess I bought like six months before the peak or maybe a year before the peak, who knows? You ready to flip? (laughs) (laughs) Well, if you think getting on a plane with a two and a half year old and a six month old is hard, I, I don't know what it would be like trying to move out of a house. Well, it reminds me of a story that you know, back in 2005, 2006, I had a buddy that, you know, we were kind of halfway through that subprime mania. There was houses going up in Florida, kind of on spec, hoping to be sold. A lot of them did get sold with two people that were thinking, you know, I'm going to flip this house and make a quick 75 grand or something like that. And I got a call from a, from a buddy of mine who had been on a bender on a Thursday night. And he said, I think I just bought a home last night at a bar in Bonita Springs, Florida. And the punchline is he did. Like he bought a home in a bar in Bonita Springs, Florida on a Thursday night. And for him, it worked out because I think he bought it in maybe 2005. So we had like another year and a half of mania before he had to get rid of it. But 
he did get rid of it, you know, and the house wasn't even completed, right? It was, it was a spec house halfway done. He bought it. I think he made his 75 grand and got out, right? That was one of the, the happy stories about that particular time. There was tens of thousands of unhappy stories that would come in the aftermath of that. But your, your story and, and my reaction to you flipping your home just reminded me of that, uh, that turn that I couldn't believe this normally very logical and reserved gentleman and his wife, I think his wife was with him when they signed the documents, bought this home in Bonita Springs, uh, sight unseen. So the TREP CMBS delinquency rate extended its downward trend last month. What did the numbers tell us? Well, we've been mentioning this for, for a long time that the numbers have been steadily declining for about a year now. We saw big spikes in delinquency in May and June of 2020. And prior to this month, it had been 11 consecutive months of declines that continued this month for a 12th month, but very, by a very narrow margin. We only saw the delinquency rate fall by one basis point this month overall. That includes every loan in our, um, our universe. If you separate it out between the stuff that was securitized after 2010 versus the entire universe. So the entire universe, which includes some legacy stuff, a small amount of legacy stuff, the rate fell by one basis point. If you looked at just CMBS 2.0 and beyond, so 2010 and beyond, that rate actually ticked up five or six basis points. So, you know, we may be starting to see kind of the end perhaps of these big declines that those that are going to, that we're going to cure have cured, right? The big hotels, they've come up with money or forbearances or modifications and are now clean and what's left may continue on this path of default foreclosure REO. Uh, and the same may be true of the malls and, and the shopping centers, you know, that, that, that remains to be seen. So that was the call it a negative part of the data that we didn't see a bigger drop that we're seeing, we saw leveling off on the positive side of the data. We continue to see a steady decline in the percentage of hotel and retail loans that are with a special servicer. So, um, I think we were about 1% in each category. Another 1% have gone back to the master servicer and are now kind of back to a watch list category, right? We're watching them, but they're not with the workout specialist anymore. So kind of a mixed bag this week, but you know, modest improvement. We might have to make new predictions now. Now that we're, we've hit a plateau and we don't know which way it's going up or down next month, we might have to make new predictions. Yeah. I mean, I think that the, you know, the big thing to take away from the last year is I don't think anybody could have seen this turning out nearly as well as it did. Well, maybe you did, Joe, because your some of your predictions did beat me. But, um, <laughs> you know, I, I think we were thinking, you know, when you saw numbers that were 70% of all hotel loans were either on watch list or special servicer and 26% were delinquent, right? It felt like locusts, right? And, you know, and snakes. And frogs. And frogs, right? Biblical type disaster. And, and here we are now, and, and our delinquency rate is 10 points better than it was at its worst. And our special servicing slash workout number continues to decline. So well, let's, um, that's let's great. Let's see how you did. Let's go back. Did I do could. biblically bad? No, is no, that what you're suggesting? not at all. Let's, let's go back in time to December of 2020. Our podcast team here, Manis and Joe, offered their predictions for how fast the recovery for the CMBS and CRE markets would be. So we're going to go back in time, look at what you guys predicted the delinquency numbers would be by property sector. And whoever is closest to the actual number obviously is the smarter of the two of you. And we'll leave that for you guys. Beyond, beyond bragging rights, is there something tangible? Like, is there like a $50 Red Lobster gift card at the, at the back end of this or... Or maybe a, a movie pass might be fitting, right? Something that helps a beleaguered industry, right? And there should be some kind idea. of, uh, you know, idea. reward. I think well, based I on your predictions for the retail and lodging sectors, I don't think 
you should be anywhere near a mall <laughs> or a hotel right now. You'd be like setting a match in the corner, trying to burn the place down just to get your predictions a little closer. We should do something here. We should do a giveaway of maybe, can we do like a gift card for a movie theater for the first, you know, five people that, that tweeted us after listening to the podcast this week? Is that allowed? We need Manus bobbleheads. That's what we need. That's Let's we get need. some of those. And then that, that should be the giveaway. Oh. Instead of him going up and down, like, yes, it's side to side. No, yeah, no, yeah, <laughs> pessimist man. Yeah. You so, need something with like a, a you know, a, a stained t-shirt, a baseball cap, you know, 11 PM shadow and Pabst blue ribbon in his hand. Pabst exactly. blue ribbon. There we go. Right. We got it all. That's it. So I think what we'll do is we'll go property by property type and I'll read out the actual number just to let everyone know what the actual number is. And then Joe and Manis, I'll let you offer up what your prediction was and why you offered that up. So give us some rationale for how you arrived at that number. So let's start with lodging, obviously the hardest hit sector. The actual number for last month is 14.27%. Back in November 2020, we were at 19.7%. So um, another drop of 5% since then and, and more than 10% overall. I predicted 15% at the time. Um, the thought being that issues that are this painful don't resolve overnight. I do agree that at this point, that 14 could become perhaps an eight in six months. But when I made that 15 prediction, uh, it was definitely with an eye on six months was not nearly enough time uh, to get these things back and going, especially considering that it wouldn't, you know, our prediction would not include the summer months. I just want to reiterate what I said last week, which is we may be the only podcast that comments on economics or finance and actually goes back and checks their work on their predictions. So I don't, I don't know if any Finn Twitter or anybody else out there goes back and, and checks on their predictions, even when they're wrong. So that's why I'll just say that I was the bullish one on all of these predictions, very bullish, because we had just gotten the vaccine news a month earlier, and it was a little bit of hopeful, hopeful predicting for me. But if you give us another four or five months, I think we can get down to where I was, which was single digits. I would say that, well, I'm going back and, and checking our work now. I wish I had done that more often in high school and college. I might not be still working and doing podcasts at my age. It's your you would just be doing podcasts for like people driving, like late night truckers driving across America. You'd have 38 listeners. I'd have 38 listeners, but they would be devoted. They'd be loyal. <laughs> All right. Retail. Uh, retail, the actual was 10.71. Yeah, Manus went hard on retail here. He predicted 16.5%. It was at 14.2 back in November when we did these predictions. My prediction, again, extremely bullish, 7.17%. And we're at 10. So I win this one by 300 basis points. Why was I so bearish at that point in time? The reason I was so bearish is that I knew we had this enormous wave of big, retail mall loans from 2011 and 2012 coming due. I expected them all to miss their balloon date and go delinquent. Uh, as it turns out, some of them have, but some of them have been modified. Some of them are kind of in that purgatory, extend and pretend, but are not uh, delinquent by our definition, um, which means that they're still paying interest on the loan, even though they've missed their balloon date. Um, so I thought that it was going to have a big impact on the market. And it has to some degree, but not nearly as big as I thought it would. So turning to office, office had an actual number of 2.09, which uh, it's actually uh, one of the better performing property sectors, but one with a lot of cloud of uncertainty. So what was your rationale for your predictions? Well, in my case, I just felt like, again, it's a timing issue that unless a uh, a borrower had a tenant that was having credit issues, you know, an energy tenant or uh, a big expiring lease that they weren't going to run into trouble. By November 2020, most of the concerns about credit tenants um, beyond WeWork and, Re you know, Regis and, and you know, co-working spaces had dissipated. And while I think that we could see a higher delinquency number down the road for offices, down the road being three or four years from now. I, I think it stays muted 
um, in the near term, you know, for a considerable period of time. I think I'm going to be right in the long run. I had 4%. I think that's, it's going to tick upwards over the next like two years. I was just encapsulating everything that I think is ever going to happen in the universe into the next six months. Well, Joe, when we get to that point, I hope you visit me in assisted living and, and, uh, you know, <laughs> you can, uh, you know, I'll give you your medal. Dennis, you wrote, you started writing Tripwire in 2009, right? Uh, that's right. And you've written it every single business day since, right? Yes, including, I don't know if I should include this. This might be too much personal information. From the including hospital. from intensive care on Long Island. <laughs> you have to include I was that. for <laughs> eight days, but I digress. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that we started this podcast in March of 2020 or April, and we've done it every week since. We have not missed a week. So I assume on your deathbed in the assisted living, I will be there with a microphone in your face, making fun of you a little bit. <laughs> well, maybe you'll have a microphone or maybe I'll be calling you, you know, you, by then you might be, you know, at, you know, some resort living, you know, retired and so forth. And I'll be saying, Joe, Joe, I'm at this facility. It's only 68% occupied. Make sure you write that in tripwire. Trading alert. <laughs> this property is going downhill and the food's terrible. So man has got the office sector. Let's move on to industrial. Industrial again, and uh, the darling of the pandemic, the actual is 0.65. And the predictions were pretty close. Yeah, this, this should just be a draw, honestly. Come on. I mean, man has predicted no change. I predicted, you know, a few basis points increase. So he wins because it was actually a decrease. Not much to say on this one other than hooray for industrial. Well, the, the big takeaway this month is that the actual number of industrial loans that are, you know, on a balance weighted basis, 65 basis points delinquent. Talk about, you know, a, a market that's just performing extraordinarily well, 65 basis points worth of delinquent loans, which is 40% lower than it was six months ago. Contrarian view, Joe Biden, FTC, antitrust, Amazon, that type of stuff. Just, you know, not that I'm saying that's going to happen, but it is a contrarian thought, right? They start breaking up Amazon and they have to, you know, close a few distribution centers or reduce their rent or something. It's just something to watch out for. Now, multifamily, the, uh, the last in this sector, the actual is 2.02. .02, and your prediction's again close. I win. Well, Joe, Joe got the win on this one. Um, in November 2020, the number was 3.1%. Um, it has fallen now to just over 2%. Uh, really has tumbled over the last six months. Joe and I were both in the low threes, but Joe was closer than I was. And so he gets the medal for that. I do get a participation medal because nobody goes home empty handed. <laughs> and, um, you know, my big thing with that was I thought that the student housing segment would show cracks in 2020 slash 2021. And as we've mentioned many times in the podcast, that was one of the biggest surprises over the last year that student housing really, really held up well, um, in terms of, of loan defaults, really, no uptick to speak of over the last 12 months in that segment. So the net of it is 3-2 Manus, the smarter of the two of you by just a bit, Joe. Sorry. By a hair. Just by sorry. a hair. I don't know what I should do. Like if I should put a belt on or if I should take like an American flag and run around the local track or put <laughs> this on LinkedIn. There's, there's got to be something, you know, some way of, of, of memorializing this just amazing honor. Maybe in 20 years, I'll be as smart as you are, Manis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Smart Alec. So, Joe, now's your chance to shine. You're going to do a spread roundup for our listeners. Yeah, so we, we promise to do this every month or quarter or so for a couple of our listeners out there who are CMBS-focused, going through kind of new issue CMBS spreads or yields. And for those non-CMBS folks out there, the point of the point you want to take away from this type of thing is if spreads increase, it means that the market is perceiving more risk and or demanding more return, right? For these types of assets, for commercial real estate assets in general, commercial real estate debt. 
Uh, and if they decrease, it's the reverse. And sometimes there's a little bit of basis effect where, you know, these are spreads to swaps and treasuries. And if the treasury rate increases or decreases, sometimes that can play with the numbers as well. But I'll just give a high level kind of overview here. I was looking at uh, AAA last cash flow super senior bonds going all the way back to the beginning of 2020. And in terms of spread, what, what I'm seeing here is beginning of 2020, we were around 80, 85 basis point area. And then all of a sudden we zoomed upwards to 145 at the peak. We had spreads really blow out. They came back relatively quickly, but kind of huddled around that 110, 115 area for several months, and then started trending downwards towards the end of 2020, below hundred basis points. We actually got back down to kind of the 60 area. And recently we had a couple of deals that were a little bit wider in March of 2021 at around 80 basis points. And now. The most recent deals were kind of back in that 65, 60 basis point range. And some of this could be due to the fact that, uh, the treasury rate has increased, uh, since the beginning of this year, right? So as the rate, the treasury rate increases, the spread required on top of that rate can sometimes decrease and the total yield for a bond buyer kind of remains the same all in yields. And this is, these are kind of rough estimates, but for the last three to four months, all in yields have been in the 230, 240 basis point range, all the way down to about 200 basis points or 2%. And that was an increase from, uh, some lower numbers back when the interest rates were a little bit lower in the 160 to, uh, to 200 basis point range earlier in the year. So a lot of numbers there, but, you know, kind of bumping along fairly well. Uh, been pretty consistent the last uh, couple months, and there's been a lot of issuance. So uh, it's good to see that there's a lot of demand soaking up this supply. We had a trading alert this week in Trepwire, and Manus is going to take a deep dive into this story and explain what it means to buy distressed bonds, how the waterfall works, and why this is a win for bond bondholders of the AJ class. So Professor Manus, class is in session. So hopefully I can explain this succinctly, uh, I'll do my best because it is a little bit complex. Hopefully I don't lose people. So as we've discussed with some of our guests before, Don Sheets being one of them, there are several ways to play in the distressed asset uh, business, right? You can buy properties, right? You can buy REO properties, real estate owned properties, properties that have been foreclosed upon. Uh, in the mall space, we've seen stories of malls being purchased, you know, at 10 or 15 cents on the dollar from valuations, maybe 10 years ago. And, and that's one way that people do this, the likes of Namdar and others, that's their business model. Another way of doing this is buying loans. You will see in the CMBS market, and Joe's going to talk about one a little bit later, where the special servicer says the best way to maximize profit or, or I should say proceeds off a distressed asset is to sell the loan and the asset buyer of that loan, the issue now becomes their problem. So perhaps the special servicer will say, we don't want to go through the 12 months necessary to foreclose on a loan, take it over as REO and then auction off the property. We'd rather make that process somebody else's problem and we will sell the note and that note can be sold for 90 cents or 80 cents or 70 cents and the buyer will come in hoping to turn that 70 cent purchase into a 90 cent resolution, right? And, and make money off that. And then the third way is you buy bonds. And what that means is you are buying something out there and a bond that is deeply distressed that you think is underpriced. And you think that, you know, something, or there's something the market is missing that may cause this bond to be undervalued. And, and the big player in this in 2011, 2012, 13 was a hedge fund called Appaloosa. And, and they really made a fortune buying bonds at 20 and 30 cents on the dollar, kind of at the trough of the great financial crisis, bonds that would ultimately, um, in some cases, go all the way back to par 
or north of par, right? Sometimes they were buying things at 30 cents on the dollar uh, and they would be trading at 105, three or four years hence. Uh, in many cases, the stuff that they were buying were what were known as mezzanine AAA bonds and junior AAA bonds. They were bonds that were rated AAA by the rating agencies in 2006 and 2007, but they weren't, they didn't have the same credit enhancement that what the quote unquote super senior AAA bonds had. So they were AAA in rating, but they had less protection than the super senior bonds. So Appaloosa came in and bought these, these assets at 20 and 30 cents on the dollar and made a killing off them and, and, and then, and good for them. So the, the bond we're going to talk about today is from a 2006 deal. It's JP Morgan, 2006 LDP seven. Uh, it was originally a nearly $4 billion deal. And there's about 10%, a little less than 10% of that balance left. Most of what is left is REO, although there's a small number of still performing loans that remain outstanding. But the bond in question was the AJ bond. It was a junior AAA bond back in 2006. It's now rated uh, CAA2 by one rating agency, D by another, and C by another. It has nine, almost $10 million in accumulated interest shortfalls. And most recently, it was getting marked, which is a quoted level, not a traded level, by our pricing team here at TREP at 22, 22 cents on the dollar. So deeply, deeply distressed. Why was it so distressed? Well, it still has five bonds behind it in credit enhancement. And that credit enhancement is uh, substantial. It's about almost 200 million or so in bonds behind it that are providing credit, credit enhancement. However, appraisal reductions in, in aggregate on this particular bond total $285 million. So the special servicers, when you take into consideration this number, they're assuming that of the $312 million left in collateral, which is made up of loans and REO properties, that the total recovery will only be about 27 million. And that 27 million will flow to that AJ bond as principal. And that's how you get that price of, of 22, right? A, 22, a $27 million recovery on a bond, which has a balance of $124 million, right? That's how the math works. But what we learned this week, or I should say it was a little bit earlier this week, but we wrote about it this week, was that the commercial observer noted that a property in that deal, the Eagle Rock property, Eagle Rock Plaza, a mall in Los Angeles had been sold for $76 million. So what that means is they're gonna, there is gonna be $76 million in cash flowing into this deal. And while not all of that 76 million will go to the AJ class, some will also go back to pay interest shortfalls on bonds um, with lower subordination than the AJ class. By our calculation, the AJ class should get upwards of 42 or $45 million. So the right price on this bond, knowing this information, is probably more like 32 or 35. So 50% higher than where it is today, right? So if somebody is sitting on this bond and doesn't know this, well, your ship may come in, good for you. Uh, the other part of it is if you see somebody offering this bond at 22, there's probably more cash in this bond coming through than where it is being quoted and where it has been trading recently. This is probably a 35, maybe even more, because at 35, you're only accounting for the Eagle Rock sale and you're getting everything else, the recovery on everything else in that portfolio for free. And if that doesn't make sense to you, feel free to email us. We'll send you the story and we'll answer whatever your questions you have. That's a little dense, but it just goes to show that for a savvy investor who follows the news and, and really gets into the weeds, there are some really pleasant surprises out there. For a savvy investor who's a TREP client and receives TREP wire in their email every morning at 6.30 in the morning. Well, this is a, there are a couple of things I'll say about this, which is interesting. <laughs> not, not all great. Before COVID, 
there were rumors, and we wrote about this in 2019, and so did the Commercial Observer, that they were hoping to get north of 100 million for this. So it could have turned out even better, right? Had COVID not happened and they could have sold this for 100 million, it's even a bigger home run. But 76 million sale in this market is terrific. And our sister company, uh, Commercial Real Estate Direct, also did a deep dive on this a week or two ago as well. So uh, they were on top of this story, uh, you know, uh, at the same time other people were. So we have a couple of must knows for the week, and then they involve moves and potential vacancies. For those who haven't listened in the last couple of weeks, we've introduced a new category, uh, the must know of the week. Hopefully we can continue to find them every single week because sometimes in slow news weeks, that may not be the case. But even though this was a holiday week, we did find a couple that uh, if you're in the commercial real estate business, you don't want to show up for your Tuesday morning meeting next week and be kind of taken by surprise by your boss asking about this. So the two stories that we have, the first one was that Goldman Sachs is on the hunt for a new office in Texas. The company right now is looking for space in Dallas. Reports are that this would be its biggest office outside of its Manhattan headquarters. The team at Goldman Sachs uh, is talking with developers uh, for expanded space in that region. And Goldman is looking to diversify. So, you know, if you are a broker in that space, if you're a developer with, uh, and, it, and we know there's a lot of it in Dallas, to be sure, uh, several 500,000 square foot plus parcels down there. Uh, if you're in that market, you want to be on top of that story. So that's our first must know of the week. Our second one, this one, God, it's a, uh, it's a hat trick for Commercial Observer. They reported that Cushman and Wakefield is considering leaving uh, its office at 1290 Avenue of the Americas. That's in the Midtown West part of Manhattan. So kind of a little bit West of Rockefeller Center. They currently have about 180,000 square feet of space at 1290 Avenue of the Americas. So this is a double must know. If you're in the commercial real estate market and you don't know this, you should, and we're helping you out. If you're at Cushman and Wakefield and you don't know this, that's probably a double bad on you. So hopefully we're uh, keeping you from uh, getting whacked in the back of the head. The interesting thing about 1290 Avenue of the Americas, it's a basically 2 million square foot office. It's huge. It's 2.1 million square feet. Its largest tenant was equitable. Equitable and equitable is still there, but they'll be moving out. Equitable has 423,000 square feet at that property on a lease that ends in 2023. Cushman and Wakefield has another 180,000 square feet. So right now between those two properties, you're talking about more than 600,000 square feet of space that if CNW chooses to leave would be vacant, right? The CNW lease goes to 2025. It's about 30% of the space in that property. And, and that's something to watch. Um, the office does back a $950 million CMBS loan that backs a 2012 single asset deal. So um, for CMBS investors, it's a single asset deal to watch. For commercial real estate brokers, it's the knowledge that Cushman and Wakefield is looking for space in Manhattan. And we have a couple of green shoots because Manus always finds something positive that's happening. So I got a couple, not as many as I normally have, but I'll, I'll bring up two. The first is that Levi Strauss, this comes from the San Francisco Chronicle, by the way, uh, Levi Strauss has renewed its lease for its San Francisco headquarters. Uh, a, lot of the off, a lot of the news in San Francisco over the last year has not been particularly happy. It's been firms uh, backing out of new offices, firms saying that they were no longer going to have a permanent full-time office space and organizations putting space on the market for sublet. Uh, here is a more positive story, which is uh, the gene maker, Levi Strauss, putting on uh, a lease renewal. And we're happy about that. Uh, I'm not a jeans wearer any longer, but I still like to report happy news, even though it's, if it's not in my sweet spot. 
the other one is CTO Realty Growth acquired a nearly 240,000 square foot mixed use property in Plano, Texas. The property is known as the shops at Legacy North, sales price 72.5 million. This comes to us by way of Globe Street. So we always like to report on properties that are in hard hit parts of the market. Uh, the retail industry has been hard hit. And so we're happy to be able to bring that one to you as well. I have to do one shout out as we always do every week for donut shorts. He had, uh, he had quoted a Bloomberg article, which from Natalie Wong, who had quoted Savills, which is basically even as Manhattan workers trickle back to their desks, the supply of available office space continues to set records. Uh, the availability rate reached 18% in the second quarter, the highest in the data ever going back three decades. It says 86 million square feet on the market. So a little crabgrass to throw in with your green shoots there. Had to do it. Had to do it. Someone's so, got to be the down the downer. The, yeah. Today it's me, I guess. So some other shout outs. Yanni M sent us a, a few points. He noticed that many servicers that they're having conversations with are considering legal fees written into the loan docs. And he had some thoughts that that was risky and not guaranteed. So had uh, had some other interesting things to say about that. He also provided us a deal of the week. Yeah, so Yanni, my man, came through with a deal of the week that he wanted us to shout out. Great job by him. This is a note sale on a actually a CMBS loan, which we had written about back in February. I believe uh, so. Yeah, February servicer data, right? It's an $8 million loan, give or take, 334-336 West 46th Street. I think it's like kind of Hell's Kitchen area. 4,000 square feet retail space with 10 apartments above it. Kind of midtown Hell's Kitchen, like I said. Uh, the main tenant is a deli. So that's interesting, I guess. Uh, and we had noted back in February that the workout code, which is an oft ignored uh, little piece of data in the CMBS reporting, had been switched to a discounted payoff. So I think that they were looking to uh, work the loan out and then they realized that they wouldn't be able to. So they put the loan up for sale. So Yanni and B6 Real Estate Advisors, this is the did, 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 did deal of the week, closed the note sale of this property uh, this past month. They closed it for a discount to par. I don't know if I really should be giving out the full number, but uh, it is a decent discount to par. Uh, a large number of investors, debt funds, and even users made a play at the collateral. And the uh, Marmoro, Yanni, if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, I'm sorry, uh, team exclusively represented uh, Midland Loan Servicer and procured the buyer. And uh, he says, keep up the good work. So you too, Yanni, keep up your good work. So the takeaway from this, and we'll write about this in Trepwire next week so that our readers and those that are keeping track of how bonds should trade stay on top of this. It's a nearly $8 million loan. It makes up 1% of a, more than 1% of a 2014 deal. The loan had been in and out of delinquency uh, over the last year, delinquent nine times out of the last 12 months. So the takeaways are, if you're the IO holder, you should be now expecting this thing will be, will disappear. Uh, if not in July, then probably in August. So that cash flow is is gone or going away. And that should be part of your analysis if you're looking to buy or sell this particular IO. And then if you're in the first pay uh, position, if you own the first pay bond, you're gonna get a sizable chunk of principal back on this particular deal sometime in the next month or two. And that should be part of your calculus as well. The collateral behind it had been valued at $14 million in 2013 and was never lowered. So for those that work off the valuation as of securitization, that would not have told the whole story in this. You would have had to refer to uh, our Trump wire stories to know that this was a possibility. And a few more shout outs, Max C, Gloria P, who said that for the past year, my favorite podcast has been the Tripwire podcast. And she said, it's actually quite humorous. Not sure why the kids don't enjoy it as much as I do. So not sure that's a mystery though. Black Eagle Real Estate on Twitter 
uh, mentioned us and Capstack Pug on Twitter. I thought this was interesting. They wanted a petition to rename Trepwire the Joe McBride experience. So I don't really know if you've paid for is that, that like, endorsement, Joe. Is that or... like the Timothy Leary experience? If you listen to Manus talk about appraisal reductions long enough, you start seeing pink elephants. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, Joe, you know, you should put yourself out there for, you know, meet and greets. We've talked about this maybe a year ago, you know. Signing the uh, baseballs, right? You know, <laughs> uh, car dealership openings, you know, sporting goods store, new new locations. Um, <laughs> Mall closings. Grit, retirement parties, you know. Just imagine, Joe McBride's here. I have to give one more shout out to Nick H. I actually... Uh... I was introduced to somebody and we were, we were trying to get a meeting and I uh, shot this guy an email saying, Hey, can, you know, you have time to catch up. And he got back and right away and said, yeah, let's catch up. And by the way, I listen to the podcast every week, big fan. I'm like, Oh my goodness. It's, it's people. It's, it's like fight club. They're coming like out to, of the woodwork. Like to hear that. You know, sometimes I wear my, my truck pullover at the golf course or, you know, just going out to get my, my morning bagel or whatever. And, you know, Nirvana would be walking down the street and somebody, you know, whispering to somebody else as they're passing by. That's, that's the podcast guy. That's, you know, that's the podcast guy. <laughs> you know, I, I wonder how many years I have to wait for that to happen. It's going to be a while. Yeah. Gonna that deathbed part. Remember that? That's going to be that. Joe, there's a guy here, 68% <laughs> occupied, but there's a guy down the hallway. who's He's been listening for 30 years. <laughs> uh. Well, it's a holiday weekend and AAA is forecasting that 47 people are expected to travel this weekend. And it's going to be the highest auto travel volume on record, surpassing 2019 levels. But if you're going to be renting a car, you can expect a 140% increase from 2019 daily rate. So I don't know, maybe you guys should just stay home. Well, I was living that quote unquote nightmare last week when I was just kind of sitting there watching the, watching the Met game, I had a, a, a couple coming to our home in South Carolina to spend a couple days with us. And I get a call from them telling me that not only are they not gonna be at my home in an hour, but they need me to drive an hour to pick them up and bring them back because even though they were contracted to get a rental car, they were stiffed. So they were at the airport and then they were shuttled over to another place that was supposed to have cars. No can do. So that was my, I guess it was Thursday or Friday. That was my uh, odyssey where I got caught into this, this whirlpool of uh, bad behavior or, or lack of inventory by the rent-a-car places. Bad well, on If them. anyone's in Northern Westchester, for the weekend and needs to rent a car, you can always hit up podcast at trep.com and I'll charge <laughs> you some one. exorbitant fees for my <laughs> 2014 Jeep. Well, nice. it's funny that there's not much I could do for people. Like I can't even hang a picture and anything I try to paint or I can't even barely weed. Like even if I weed, I don't weed, <laughs> you know, I leave, I leave too many things out there. It still looks terrible after I spend an hour doing it, but I can lend you my car. Nice. Right? That's uh you know, I'm capable of that and moving furniture. I'm pretty good at that too. Well, with that, we'll close. Thanks to our producer, Haley Keene. Join us next week as we review what's happened during the week and how it may be impacting. If you have a question or comment, send the email to podcast at trep.com. For more info, visit trep.com and subscribe to the podcast with your favorite provider. Have a great weekend, guys. Thank you for listening and stay well. All right. <laughs> <laughs>